Greetings and salutations. Welcome to Knife Chats with Tobias. <coughs> Greetings and salutations. Welcome to Knife Chats with Tobias. Well, happy 4th of July, also known as Independence Day in the United States of America. And I was wondering how could I celebrate this online with my knife channel? And a couple of things that came to mind, one of them was, well, show a bunch of knives that are red, white, and blue, which I'm sure quite a few people are going to do. But I really do not have enough American-made knives in white to actually do that. So it's like red, white, and blue is out the, out the window. And then it's like, well, maybe other knives with a patriotic theme. And uh, unfortunately, most of my <laughs> knives that have a patriotic theme supporting the United States are not made in the United States. And I really wanted to celebrate the uh, independence of the United States with knives made in the United States. I know, crazy idea. And so what I did was I said, well, let's look at um, some pocket knives from World War II. And so what we have here are knives that represent the various branches of the U.S. military during World War II. Now, I want to add something before I move into talking about all the individual knives, and that is that uh, unlike some uh, militaries around the world, the United States military does not um, automatically issue knives to its service members. It did not do that during World War II. Uh, it did not do that during Vietnam. It did not, it doesn't do it now either. Um, the way it works with the US military is if they feel that you need a particular tool or weapon, they will issue it to you. But if they do not see a need for that tool being issued to you, uh, they're not going to give it to you. So typically, um, quite often the knives that a U.S. service member carries is one that they locally procured or they picked up at the, um, the base exchange, post exchange, ship exchange, something like that, or they had it given to them by a relative who bought it and sent it to them, things of that nature. Or they went to the, um, the class two store and they bought a knife there. Uh, so typically the knife, the pocket knife that a U.S. soldier or sailor or Marine or airman, if they have one on them, chances are they bought it themselves. It wasn't given to them uh, by the branch of service uh, or by the military. Now there are exceptions, obviously, especially in times of war and especially in a combat zone where then the need for a particular pocket knife might come in handy. Uh, and so that will happen. You know, the, the soldier will actually be given a knife or a pocket knife because, well, they need it. So like a bayonet is, if you, if you get a rifle, chances are you get a bayonet and it is assigned to you, especially in a combat zone. Uh, same with a pocket knife. You might get one given to you if the military feels that you need one. It's just not automatically done like it is in like the Swiss Army, I believe. And what's more, um, I believe the first branch of service to actually adopt a knife for service use was the United States Navy. And I think they might have done that shortly after the Civil War. So the country had been around for four score and seven years, 87 years without an official knife for any branch of service. Sometime after the Civil War, uh, the Navy got a, a rope knife that was specifically designed for them or adopted for them. And it was uh, actually a, a knife that came out of Sheffield, England. Now, by the time World War I rolled around, uh, there were a few knives that were adopted for military service, but they were not something that was routinely given to a soldier. One such weapon was, or one such knife was like the Signal Corps knife. They, that was something that the uh, United States Army Signal Corps had adopted. And linesmen uh, would 
would receive them. And there were also things like machetes and stuff like that that were adopted for service use, um, as well as uh, the knives that you would find in a mess kit and stuff like that. But for the most part, pocket knives were an afterthought and it was not something that was routinely given to uh, service members, even up to World War I. It was sometime between World War I and World War II that uh, the different branches of services uh, started looking at adopting some of the knives that you have in front of us here. And in some cases, some of these knives were not adopted until actually World War II had already started. And for the most part, many of these knives were straight off the shelf with just a, a new marking added or something like that. It wasn't until during World War II that some of these knives were modified uh, to meet the demands of the uh, military. So let's start with the very first knife up front. And this is a knife representing the United States Army. Uh, as you can see, it has nice bone handles here. It has brass liners and uh, carbon steel back springs and the shield that reads USA. Now, the USA does not actually stand for United States of America. This was the shield adopted uh, by the United States Army. And that's what the USA actually stands for, United States Army. And you see it has a uh, nickel silver bolster here. This was a knife straight off the shelf. Uh, I know it's a, an early war production because as you can see, it still has brass spacers and liners in the back here. Uh, in 1943, a directive came out from the Department of War uh, that basically said that the brass had to go. You needed to go to carbon steel uh, spacers and uh, liners as well as carbon steel back springs because the brass was needed for the war effort. So, and then also you ended up with like stainless steel uh, bolsters and everything else. The nickel silver and everything else just kind of went and you had a, a more sterile knife, basically. But this is an early war production one. Uh, you see there the four lines for Camillus. Let me close this carefully, because unfortunately it is not in the best of shape and the all gets in the way of the blade when I close it. So as you can see right there, so you have a little blade crossing going on here. You know, the knife is 80 plus years old. Cap lifter screwdriver here, the short version, and then the old style uh, can opener there. One piece can opener. And this is a, a Camillus knife made for the United States Army. Another knife right next to it is from the United States Navy. And this is a, uh, a, a jackknife for the sailors and you can see here this one is all stainless steel I'm sorry all carbon steel and that means this one was made during the war most likely um, you also see it has steel bolsters going on still has the bone handles and uh, that might nope that is also steel everything about this knife is steel and bone and uh, the bone would later be replaced by plastic. Now this one has a blade that was broken, as you can tell. The blade somehow was broken and whoever had it uh, fixed the blade, turned it into a coping blade. This should also be just a, a regular pin blade. And you can see it has the easy open cutout here. It was basically an off the shelf, easy open jack that was adopted by the Navy. And that was adopted sometime in the 1930s. However, this one was probably made during World War II. Uh, secondary blade or primary blade rather is a nice spear blade. And this spear blade is uh, pretty much full. So it's a relatively nice example. Really do need to get one with a proper pin blade though. And this was the U.S. Navy Jack, and it was used throughout World War II. And it was even uh, a version of this same knife was also being used as early as World War I by the United States Navy. And it was something that quite a few sailors would have had, and some of them would have had it issued. 
Now this, uh, this knife is also going to be representing a little bit of the United States Army, but really this is a knife that was used by all branches of services during World War II. Uh, the Army used it, the Air Force or the Army Air Force used it, the Navy used it, Coast Guard used it, Marines definitely used it. Any person who was laying line, any kind of communications person, you know, some kind of signalman would have been issued a TL-29 uh, along with a pair of wire cutters. Anyone who is having to lay down telephone line, anyone working on radios or any of that stuff, would have had a TL-29. It would have been something that would have been issued to them. And uh, this is again, one that is early in the war. You can tell that by the brass uh, spacer here down the middle. Uh, this one also has wood covers uh, and the metal TL-29 shield going on there. So this might've even been made before World War II. It is a, an example by Camillus Almost every knife company imaginable was making these during World War II. Uh, this one has a nice full uh, spear blade, and then it has the uh, screwdriver blade going on here, which has a section that is actually sharpened, and then you also have the wire strip proportion there, and it has the brass liner lock going across there. And quite a few of these continue to have the brass uh, liner lock going across because it was kind of necessary for the knife to function properly. However, some of them were made with a, a steel liner lock going across. And you notice the half stops and everything else. But the TL-29 is one of those knives that was a knife that was issued to quite a few people. Anyone in the Signal Corps or anyone even, there were plenty of people in the front lines who were laying a wire. <laughs> So, and the TL-29 was something that they would have been issued. Now, next up is uh, a knife representing the United States Marine Corps. And this was a big deal. Uh, originally, these knives, even the Marine Corps knives, were similar to what you see with the Army knife here. They had the bone handle. Then they went to a plastic handle, the plastic handle and the bone handle. And even the, um, the steel in here, had the same issue. They would uh, they would rust very quickly in the Pacific, and the knife would become unusable. Now, this is made after uh, 1944. The brass restrictions were gone, so they ended up going back to using brass on the uh, for the liners because it was necessary. But they needed something more durable for the covers because the covers on these uh, other knives, the bone covers, the stag covers, um, the uh, wood, any of that stuff would just rot, fall apart. They needed something more sturdy. And so they ended up with a stainless steel cover on these knives and that solved the problem. And this also was the forerunner to the, uh, the modern day milk knife. Now, originally these were known as an MIL-J, as in Juliet. M-I-L-J uh, and the J stood for Jack because it was a military jackknife and that's because the Marines followed suit of the United States Navy and that a knife was known as a Jack. This was a Navy Jack. It wasn't a Navy knife and so this is a military jackknife originally uh, when it also saw, started seeing service with the uh, with the uh, other branches of service, then it became an MILK or military knife. But originally these were a military jackknife. And these were made by Kingston and Stevens at first. Uh, two different companies, Kingston or Stevens. Uh, and that was actually uh, Imperial and Ulster uh, getting together and forming a company. And you see here you have the uh, the cap lifter screwdriver, and it's got a little knot, knot right on there, or a little nub, thumb stud. And that is so you can open the blade easily, even though it does have this. And it also is to help you differentiate from the new safety can opener 
that was added to these knives. So you finally see the, the, the safety style can opener showing up. This happened in 1944 and it is actually stamped can opener so that soldiers would know that this was the can opener or Marines, everyone actually, just so they know this is the can opener because it differed so much from the earlier can opener. And there was this, a reason for that. Uh, as crazy as it sounds, uh, a lot of soldiers were being taken out of action by the can opener on these old knives. Um, and that's because these would cut up and it would cause a jagged edge around the edge of the, the, the can. And also these had a tendency to slip. Soldiers would end up cutting their hands. The cuts would get infected. The next thing you know, they're in the, uh, the aid station or they're in a hospital bed because of infection, um, which was common in, uh, especially in uh, the Pacific. So the safety can opener solved that problem and cut the uh, can downward. It uh, was easier to use uh, and more effective as a can opener. So everything worked on that a whole lot better. And then you have the new blade here, same spear blade. This one is worn down a bit, probably about 80% full and then a nice long uh, triangular shaped uh, awl or uh, punch blade on there. But that's the uh, United States military or United States Marine Corps uh, military jack. And let's move over to the left side again. And this is the Coast Guard approved knife. Uh, a lot of people are familiar with this knife and they think it's a Coast Guard knife and I guess the Coast Guard could have used it. You see there, approved Coast Guard uh, 1945, 1944 Q5. And these are also called a Q5. This is an early version of it. This is a jigged wood handle. The three cuts in there must have been done by the original uh, member or original owner of this knife. And it might have been for how many years he'd been in service. Uh, you see here it's got uh, the brass liners going on. Well, 1944, they were back to using brass. And it's got that wonderful uh, sheep foot blade going on there. And this is a, a Camillus knife. And also, if you notice, Camillus, New York, USA. Now, some people will look at that and go, well, it's not a four-line knife, so it wasn't used in World War II. Actually, at the very end of uh, World War II, Camillus was making knives with three lines and as this was a new pattern that is why this knife has three lines instead of four lines you will find some occasionally with four lines uh, but this is actually a knife that would have been seeing service around 44 or 45 as the blade stamp on the back shows and the interesting thing about this is this knife while it says u.s coast card approved does not necessarily mean the knife was used by the Coast Guard. Uh, this knife was approved for use by the Merchant Marines, by the U.S. Coast Guard. That's what the stamp on there uh, probably means, that, that this was a knife suitable for use on Merchant Marine vessels. Uh, but it was used by Merchant Marines, it was used by the Coast Guard, might have even been seeing some service with the United States Navy. I do not know for certain on that last part though. And now we have three knives in the back and these knives are all knives that were found uh, not necessarily in the pockets of uh, soldiers, airmen or sailors or Marines, but in emergency kits that were used by um, the uh, airmen of the various branches. Now this one here, this one can easily fly under the radar of anybody who is collecting knives. But if you can see here, it is all steel construction, steel bolsters, steel liners, steel back springs, and then it's just a three blade stockman. You see here, uh, Camillus Cutlery, company Camillus New York USA. It's a four line Camillus Stockman with a wonderful little uh, spear master blade. And then the other two blades that it has is a sheep foot blade 
And then finally, the last blade it has is a pin blade. So you've got a pin blade, a spear master blade, and a sheep foot blade. You can see that it had plastic handles here and the handles have shrunk a little bit. And what this knife is, is an Army Air Force uh, emergency knife. This is the knife that was kept in the, uh, the bailout bags for pilots and uh, crewmen on bombers and stuff. So this simple stockman was the knife of choice by the uh, Army Air Force during World War II. And later on, you'll see similar knives like this, but they will be all steel construction, similar to the uh, milk knife and it'll still be just a stockman knife. But this was a knife used during World War II by uh, the Army Air Force for emergency bailout kits um, for their pilots and uh, for the crews of the bombers and even you know cargo aircraft and everything else. Anyone who was up in the air probably had one of them stockmans with them, either in their emergency kit or in their pocket because they just were all over the place. And over here is the Army Air Force and Navy emergency knife. And it's, as you can tell, it is basically a fish knife, uh, but again, all steel. You got a little uh, clevis up on top, which is an interesting location for it, but that also prevents it from interfering with the blade. And if you notice the end here is a hook remover um, and then you got the nice long blade going on there. You see there, Camillus Cutlery Company, Camillus New York, USA. You've got the fish scaler on the top and you push that up and it's out of your way when you're cutting and everything. The liner lock comes across so that the blade won't close on you when you're using it. And it was basically um, a small survival knife for, you know, so you could uh, clean game and gut fish and scale fish and all that other stuff and so it is a bird and trout knife basically a folding bird and trout knife uh, that was issued to army air force and also navy pilots and navy crews um, and these were in general probably more useful in the uh, pacific and in the mediterranean whereas these were probably more useful in northwest europe but uh, both of them might have been serving in both areas. I do not know for certain on that, but these were also a knife that was designed for use in the emergency kits of aircrew. And the last knife in the back is also a knife that was used uh, in the emergency bailout gear for aircrew uh, of all branches of service. At least I believe it was also used by the Navy, but it is known as the Army Air Force Folding Machete, also known as the Jungle Machete, uh, because this was primarily issued in the Pacific Theater uh, for air crew. Uh, and I know the Army Air Force used it quite extensively, and it became a tool that the Army Air Force was continuing to use in its bailout gear after World War II. Um, I'm not 100% sure if the Navy used this at all during uh, World War II, but it is something that was used by the Army Air Force. And the reason it's a folding machete is because they originally had a different machete in their, uh, in their bailout gear, and it was just too long. They needed something shorter. The, 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 the word went out they wanted something that was under a foot long. And uh, this comes in right around 11 and a half inches when it's closed. Uh, but when you open it up, you've got this wonderful blade that is, how long is this blade? Um, you got a 10 inch blade on this thing once it's opened up. And that was the, uh, the key. You've got a 10 inch machete blade or bolo style blade and a six inch handle going on here and a very positive liner lock. Now, as you can tell, it's got a, a edge cover for the, uh, for the machete. Uh, that's because this was not issued with a sheath or anything. It came as part of the bailout gear and it was just in a, a pouch inside everything. Um, I suppose if you needed a pouch, you would have to be throwing it in a pocket or, or I have no idea or you better not lose the, uh, 
the cover. I guess that's really what it came down to. But once you get the cover off, let me see if I can get the cover off. There we go. Cover is off. You see it's just a thin metal cover. If you notice, it has black paint on it. I believe the entire thing was painted black at one time. This particular one is by Case, uh, but three other companies also made these. Uh, wonderful black plastic or phenolic handle going on there. Uh, and notice the angle of it, how it narrows down. You've got a very strong liner lock here. It's all carbon steel throughout. I believe it's a 1095 carbon steel blade going on. Um, and very strong and can definitely do some serious cutting and you do have a cross guard going on to help prevent your hand from sliding up on the blade. Blade is sharp all the way to the back here so even when you put on the cover not the entire cutting edge of the blade is covered but uh, before closing the blade I strongly advise putting the cover on because this is such a strong lock that you almost feel like you need to grip the blade just to close it. And uh, when you're closing it, it shuts like a guillotine there. So it's a very strong blade. In any case, uh, Army Air Force uh, Survival Machete, also known as a Jungle Machete. Now, you'll see another version of this out there that was made by Imperial that has a uh, a blade guard that is attached to the handle that folds into the handle that was not used during World War II. That came out in 1948 and it was a replacement for this original um, Army Air Force folding machete. Um, this ended up serving alongside of it so these were still in service with the uh, United States Air Force well into the 1950s, possibly even into the 1960s among bomber crews and stuff like that. But in any case, I just thought I'd show that one to you as well. And that is um, a rundown on uh, a variety of knives used in World War II by U.S. military service personnel, all made in the United States. Uh, thought I'd show that to you for this wonderful 4th of July. Uh, and while you're out there celebrating, uh, take some time to think seriously about what it took to form this country and just how important our freedoms and liberties are. Uh, these are not things that we should take lightly and these are not things that we should expect other people to uh, uh, defend for us. These are things that we must actively protect ourselves uh, because if we do not protect our own freedoms our own liberties who will let me take just a second to thank you once again for dropping by and spending a few minutes here at knife chats with the pious i really do appreciate it and i do appreciate any comments that you leave so please uh, remember to give me that thumbs up and also don't forget to Subscribe and ring that notification bell so you'll know when the next episode is up and running. Thanks again for dropping by. Really do appreciate your time here.